Hey, Chris, I figured I'd shoot a video um, given your response here. Uh, this is, you know, where's the Hail Mary found in the Bible? Um, and then, of course, you said uh, this is a great example of how to take uh, Scripture out of context. I'm assuming that means you think that finding the Hail Mary in Scripture uh, is taking it out of context. And so I wanted to kind of uh, explain a little bit about where this prayer really comes from, because uh, actually what it is, I, I always break it up into, into basically four parts, a Scripture verse, a Scripture verse, the name of Jesus, and then uh, a petition for prayer, right? So the first part, the Hail Mary, full of grace, literally does come from Scripture. It's it's the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary. Hail, kecharitomine uh, is the, the Greek phrase. You who has been perfectly graced, um, the Lord is with you. Um, and so that's the opening of the Hail Mary. It's, it's addressing, obviously, the mother of Jesus, Mary. Um, so Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, which of course is the words of her kinswoman Elizabeth when she goes to greet, uh, when she goes to greet her. So again, that's just two verses of scripture. Um, you know, we pray along those lines quite often. Mary actually gives us a beautiful prayer as well called the Magnificat uh, in her own words in Luke's gospel as well. Uh, it's commonly used in the, the divine liturgy, which is prayed every single day uh, all around the world uh, by many Christians, not just Catholics, uh, but definitely Christians. And of course, after that, we, we name the fruit of that womb, right? So blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's kind of the, the, the linchpin of the whole prayer. That's like right in the center of the prayer. And then immediately after that, it's just a petition. So Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, here's where a lot of people have, you know, an objection or a question to say, well, why are you asking Mary to, to pray for you? Right. Where do you get that in, in the scriptures? I think that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to address that first off by saying, um, a, it, it, I, I hope that you would pray for me and pray for anybody here who's who you think is mistaken theologically. Um, I hope that you'd be willing to lift them up in prayer and ask um, that you know ultimately they find the truth, whatever that truth may be. As a Catholic, uh, I'm always open to the truth. And if somebody showed me that Catholicism was was demonstrably false, um, I would listen to any argument uh, to that effect. And I would, uh, you know, if I truly believed that it was uh, not the church that Jesus founded, then I would leave Catholicism, right? So I hope that you would lift us up in prayer. But, and I often do this a little tongue in cheek when I ask people to do that, I say, well, is there a problem with me asking you to pray for me? As a lot of people will say, well, no, because I'm, you know, whatever. They'll say, I'm usually they'll say, because I'm here and I'm alive. So we'll address that in a minute. Uh, clearly, we can ask other people to pray for us. Uh, St. Paul gives us his example very, very clearly, even saying, pray for our leaders, even the ones that persecute us, right? Um, and he asked for prayers on his behalf as well, prayers on behalf of his friends, like on Sepphoris, um, all over the place. So clearly, we have this biblical model of petitioning um, other people for prayer. So it seems even though even though God knows our our needs even before we ask him, right? God is 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 God. He's outside of time, he's omniscient, he's he's all knowing, omnibenevolent, he knows everything we need even before we ask. And yet we're given the model of prayer, praying for ourselves, praying for each other, praying for other people. And part of the reason for that is because it's good for us, right? The body of Christ is one. Um, and I'll come back to that point again in a minute too. Uh, but the body of Christ is united. And because of that, it's good for us to strengthen that unity through our prayer, through lifting up each other in prayer. So then the question becomes, well, what about those who have gone on and, and are no longer with us in this life, right? Those who have, who have died. Well, we know a couple things. First off, not everybody who has died, died in, in the normal way. Um, so for instance, going all the way back, we know there's an interesting reference in Genesis to a guy named Enoch, who we're told at the end of his life walked with God. We have Elijah, who was taken up to heaven uh, at the end of his life in, in a fiery chariot. Um, at the uh, at the days of, of the resurrection, when, when Jesus uh, died and, and resurrected, we actually read in, I think it's Matthew's gospel, um, that numerous graves were open and the dead walked amongst the living in Jerusalem and then went on up to heaven. So we clearly see that there is some kind of an awareness in the, I feel if Jesus even gives us, you know, the parable of, you know, Lazarus and the rich man, right? And it's the only parable where he actually gives a name to the person uh, in the parable and it happens to be his friend, uh, Lazarus, who actually dies and then comes back from the dead. And that's kind of the whole point of that parable. So even Jesus seems to, to state uh, very clearly that those in the afterlife uh, have 
um, awareness, you know, of, of what's going on. And we can see that in lots of other places as well. Um, in fact, Jesus, we're told by Peter in first Peter three, uh, he descends into hell and preaches the gospel to the, the spirits who are in prison, uh, who were, who were disobedient in the days of Noah. So he actually presents the gospel posthumously, uh, to those who never had a chance to, to receive it. And they're aware of it, right? They, they receive it and, uh, you know, whatnot. So again, it's very, very scriptural to believe, uh, at the very least that these people uh, are aware of us. And then of course we have things like, uh, you know, James tells us, uh, I think somebody even put that right here. Um, you know, St. James tells us to pray for one another. And he also says that the prayers of the righteous, there we go. The prayers of the righteous have great power. The prayer of the righteous uh, availeth much. Well, obviously those who've gone on to heaven are going to be, uh, be the most be the most righteous. And we actually have a scriptural reference for that as well. We actually have a couple scriptural references for that. One of them comes from the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we see the 24 elders in heaven, which basically represent uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then of course, the 12 apostles, they present the prayers of the saints on earth, those struggling uh, as incense to God. And then three chapters later, that was Revelation 5 and Revelation, Revelation 8, the angels do the same thing. They present the prayers of those on earth to God in in the form of incense or as a, it, it's obviously there's a lot of imagery going on there, but the clear point is the people in heaven are presenting the prayers of the people of earth on earth to God, like incense in the temple, right? Or in the church. And of course we have the Psalmists, right? Uh, David, Solomon, uh, all of the Psalms, uh, so many of them invoke the heavenly host, uh, all the angels, all the saints, all the creatures, you know, everybody, they invoke, they invoke everybody and say, pray with me, pray with us, praise God, praise him in the heights, right? So clearly we actually have a very biblical model that says those who have gone on before us, um, if they are in heaven at the very least, uh, are aware of us in some capacity. In fact, uh, Hebrews 11 gives a litany of all of the great uh, heroes of the Old Testament, starting um, you know back with Abraham going all the way up uh, to the time of, of right before Jesus, and you know all the great patriarchs and 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 everything else, and. Then Hebrews 12 immediately comes in. Of course, the chapter divisions weren't there originally. Hebrews 12 says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, speaking of all of those who have gone before us. And of course, what do witnesses do but witness, right? So we have so many scriptural points that tell us that those who have gone before us can pray for us and those on this earth can pray for us, that it really shouldn't be that hard to understand why Christians from the very first century on have prayed uh, to other Christians. Uh, praying just means to ask, right? Uh, and ask them to ask on their behalf. Now, to pray to Mary is not to worship Mary. Um, or any other saint or, or person, right? That absolutely would be wrong. Uh, we should not be worshiping anybody uh, other than the, the the triune God, to be sure. Uh, and if you ever find a Catholic who's actually worshiping Mary, tell him to stop. <laughs> but chances are what most people think that they think the Catholic Church teaches uh, usually is just a misunderstanding and, and they don't get it. And hopefully this video was helpful. Uh, so let me know, Chris, uh, if that made sense. If you have any questions, I'm happy to shoot another video for you. But I just hope that this uh, was, was a little bit helpful. God bless, man. Say a prayer for me, and I'll say a prayer for you.